Hello, and welcome to this presentation of uh, information requirements of collision-based micromanipulation. This is work that we completed for the workshop on algorithmic foundations of robotics. Uh, so I'm very excited to be able to share this work with the public. Uh, my name is Alexandra Nellis. Uh, this work is joint work with Anna Pervin and Tommy Beretta from Northwestern University, um, along with our advisors, Todd Murphy at Northwestern and Steve Laval at uh, UIUC, as well as the University of Ulu. So we're very excited to share this work. Um, I'll start by giving just some background on this sort of strange uh, topic. So we're inspired by the capabilities of biological systems to navigate and influence their environment, uh, even if they don't have the ability to map or have any sort of centralized control if they're a collective. Uh, so at small scales, biological systems seem to use mostly just incidental collisions. So they just happen to bump into things and then how they react during that interaction governs their, their global behavior. So here we see a video of a swimming eukaryote. I'll start it over. He's coming up to this boundary uh, of his environment at the top and then they rotate depending on the, the ciliary interactions and leave the environment at a controllable angle. So uh, for more, you can look at this paper uh, on ciliary contact interactions uh, and the relationship with surface scattering. So we find this really interesting. Um, so at these length scales, we're able to just interact with their environment. It's safe um, and the structure is largely determined by the agent morphology. So looking toward future design of artificial swimmers, uh, our research project asks if we can uh, leverage structured boundary interactions to accomplish tasks such as object manipulation. So research into micro robotics and micro manipulation has been ongoing for a long time, uh, although these two fields have been largely separate. So on the micro robotics side, uh, those systems can either have some global observation and control mechanism or the, the micro swimmers or micro robots can be completely autonomous and reactive. Uh, one challenge with this research is that it's very difficult to control many agents independently at the same time. So it's hard to differentiate the agents if you have a large number of them. Uh, and common tasks for micro robots include navigating, following a given trajectory, aggregating, or just exploring their environment. And then on the other hand, we have micro manipulation research uh, where we're mostly focusing on moving one or a few objects at a small length scale. Uh, these almost entirely use external microscopes, external robotic manipulators or electromagnetic fields to accomplish the task. And since we're, we're manipulating objects, the tasks we're interested in is mostly construction or biological characterization, um, working toward eventually precision surgery and applications like that. But our work in this presentation is going to focus on micro manipulation using micro robots. So this is a hard problem. We need to think deeply about how sensing and actuation work at this scale. Um, shrinking full-sized robots and using our traditional manipulation algorithms doesn't really work. Um, fortunately, biology pr provides a nice proof of concept that we can solve sophisticated construction problems by using just largely diffusive systems that just bump into things. Um, so we're presenting the beginning of, of theoretical work toward, toward this uh, area. So one challenge is that uh, to provide useful forces with micro robots, we need to control an entire collective uh, without the ability to individually control each agent. Of course, we're not the first people to work on this. So there has been some interesting work on information requirements of collective manipulation at the micro scale. Uh, Aaron Becker and his team is a, a leader in this field. So they've done some work on human in the loop control, looking at what statistics you need about the swarm of particles to be able to control them and do object manipulation. Um, at the macro scale, people have been looking into information requirements, um, like this paper from Donald Jennings and Roos uh, in IJRR. Uh, now it's important to note that both of these, these highlighted works, and there's a lot more in, in the paper itself, but most of the work out there focuses on pushing directly objects. So assuming we can aim the robot at the object and then push it in the direction we want to go, whereas our work focuses on using incidental collisions and having the object manipulation emerge um, as a result of the motion patterns of the robots. 
So I'll talk a little bit about the constraints of the small scale on the kinds of assumptions we can make on sensing and actuation. So like I said, individual control, not necessarily feasible. Uh, they need to be able to react locally. Uh, traditional sensors and actuators are not available, and in general, um, our sensing and control just gets a lot more coarse at the small scale, so things might happen uh, by regions instead of at specific points. So I'll give an example of um, some of the sensors available at this scale. We have chemical comparators, um, which is a type of sensor that can tell you whether there's more of chemical A or chemical B present in the system. Um, we also might be able to detect a gradient. So we might be able to detect uh, the direction of increasing concentration, even if we can't uh, tell exactly where we are or where the source is. Um, so this picture here shows two chemical sources, blue and yellow. If you have a comparator, you might be able to tell which region you're in on the left or right, uh, assuming the chemicals are diffusing evenly in the environment. And you would be able to tell which direction the sources are in uh, from anywhere in this little environment. And then the last piece of background I'll start with is um, talking about a little bit about information spaces, <clears throat> which are a game theoretic approach to analyzing information requirements of tasks. So first we consider the information history space of every robot design we're looking at. So all the possible sequences of actions and sensor readings that robot can, can produce. Uh, then the goal is to define a derived information space that captures the task structure and allows us to, to make some statements about success. Um, and another key feature of this information space is that all of the individual robot histories, even if they have different designs, um, can be mapped to this same derived information space so that we can reason about what the robots know. Um, and then we can we can use that derived information space to compare the capabilities and uh, success of different designs. So we'll jump into the model. Uh, we're approaching directed transport in a long corridor. So we essentially have a cart on the track model where we have a rectangular object that are, we're trying to push into a goal region. Um, we're not looking at rotation or vertical translation. We're just looking at um, translation back and forth within this corridor. So to break the symmetry of this problem, we assume that the object has two distinguishable sides on the left and right. So to a micro robot, these might be differentiated with a chemical comparator or a detectable directional electromagnetic field. Um, but here we're just going to use blue and yellow uh, and assume that these are visible to the robots if there's a clear line of sight uh, between them and the side of the object. And then we introduce a bunch of primitives. Uh, so a primitive defines a mode of operation of a robot. So it might be either a sensor or an actuator or both if you have um, some mechanism that does both at the same time. So we use six primitives in this work. Um, the top four are taken from this paper by Jason O'Kane and Stephen Laval on comparing the power of robots. Um, and then the bottom two are our new definitions. So we'll go through the actuators, the first three um, primitives. So primitive A describes a rotation relative to a local reference frame. So we give it an angle theta and the robot will be able to rotate that amount. Uh, primitive L corresponds to a forward translation over a specified distance. So we give it a distance D and it can translate forward that amount. Primitive T carries out forward translation, but just forever until it it runs into an obstacle, so no specified distance there. Primitive R, moving into sensors, um, is a range sensor, so uh, we're able to detect the distance from ourselves to the nearest boundary. Primitive B is a blue sensor that's just a binary sensor that outputs one if we can see the color blue uh, along our line of our, line of our heading, uh, and same thing with yellow. So uh, these are just our six simple primitives. Obviously, these could be implemented in many different ways uh, at the hardware level, but we hope that these are abstract, but uh, still useful. And so once we had these primitives uh, designated, we developed modular subroutines that allowed us to develop a hierarchical controller. So uh, here we'll just discuss two of the subroutines, while following and limit cycle. Uh, so while following, it can be implemented many different ways. Here we just uh, assume that we use the range sensor and rotating um, a small angle to be able to follow a wall while still keeping it uh, in your line of sight. 
So this could also be implemented mechanically as well. Um, a lot of, if you have a, a flat side of your robot and it encounters a, a wall, it will just move along that wall. So, um, and then the, really the meat and potatoes of this approach is this limit cycle subroutine. So we noticed in simulation that uh, if the robot rotates by 120 degrees in place, um, or 60 degrees, depending on which direction you're rotating, uh, then, and it has, um, you know, these three, depending on the shape of its environment, it's able to execute a, a triangular motion pattern. So we just have three rotations moving forward until you hit an obstacle, and that, that the goal of that is to get you into a triangular cyclical uh, motion pattern. And then we've also implemented uh, a counter um, in the sub strategy so that uh, the robot is able to count how many times it attempts to complete one cycle. You can think of this as kind of a virtual sensor for this, this subroutine. And so the key insight in this paper is that by taking advantage of these spontaneous limit cycles from this autonomous motion pattern, uh, we can engineer trajectories that, because of these accidental or incidental collisions, uh, manipulate the object. So the figure on the right shows an example of such a trajectory uh, in simulation. And you can see that it's it's converging from initial conditions into a, a triangular motion pattern. Um, and then the figure on the left shows a geometric setup. So we modeled this motion pattern and investigated its stability. Uh, I'll just give you a brief overview of that. You can read the paper for more details, but we investigated the relationship between alpha, which is the, the initial condition, the angle that it hits the obstacle with, um, as well as the object contact location and theta. So for both of these, we found that there's a pretty wide band of, of stable initial conditions. Uh, so a pretty big region of attraction for that limit cycle. Um, we also found that that it's stable for small perturbations in theta, so that if you're not rotating exactly perfectly, you'll still enter a roughly triangular motion pattern. Um, so yeah, once we had these building blocks, we started being able to play around with different designs for the hierarchical controller and comparing their, their feasibility as well as their capabilities. So um, there's a lot on this slide. We'll start on the left uh, with robot one. So this is our most capable robot that uses all six of the primitives in its design, um, but no other capabilities. And we went through and showed that geometrically, this robot can achieve its goal no matter its initial conditions. So you can put that robot down anywhere in the environment and it has strategies to, you know, first of all, determine where it is, whether it's on the right, middle or left, and then eventually enter into a, a successful limit cycle. Um, in the middle, we have a simple robot design uh, composed of four primitives. So <clears throat> we took away uh, the yellow detection sensor, as well as the actuator that lets the robot move forward for a controllable distance. So it's still able to move forward until it hits a, an object, but is no longer able to control its forward movement uh, beyond that. And we found that this, this robot um, is able to succeed as long as its initial conditions are on the left side of the object. Um, otherwise, it, it becomes lost. And then finally, we looked at robot three with only three primitives, um, which can only be successful if its initial conditions are within that region of attraction of the limit cycle. Um, here, we removed the sensor that reports distance to the nearest obstacle, so no rangefinder or anything here. Um, it's pretty easy to see that from our, the way that we've designed our controllers here, um, that robot one is strictly more capable than robot two, and robot two is strictly more capable than robot three. Um, so this means that in the task, um, robot one should be the most performant and most successful. Um, so while these policies are not trivial, um, these figures at the bottom give a really nice geometric intuition for the dominance hierarchies between these robots. So um, if either robot two or robot three are initialized into any of these white regions that indicate being lost, um, they will fail at the task. So really you can think about the volume in the workspace of this, these spaces where you will definitely get lost. Um, you can think about that volume as representing um, also the capabilities of the robot. So the larger the volume of spaces where you can get lost, uh, the least capable your robot is. So we're able to formalize this really nicely for this simple task. Um, 
it's also worth noticing, noting that this capability comparison is just for our specific control architectures. So we're not making any claims that no robot with these, these uh, three primitives is able to complete the object manipulation task. So there may be some other more clever algorithms or inference uh, methods that will guarantee task success from a broader range of initial conditions. Um, so our derived information space actually ends up being really simple. Um, I talked about how we have this count variable for the limit cycle subroutine. So we're essentially, um, to, to skip a lot of formalisms, using that as our derived information space. So we use uh, all the positive integers and we just want to guarantee that we've successfully completed a limit cycle more than n times, assuming that it just takes n nudges or collisions to push the object into the goal region. So we just want to guarantee that we can cycle around n times. And it doesn't matter, you know, since all of our robots have the, the limit cycle subroutine in common, we can compare them directly. Um, a lot of the details for that are in the paper, but I'll just uh, highlight this, uh, this lost state again, because I think it's really interesting, um, especially since none of our agents are mapping or have any idea about the geometry of the space. It's sort of non-trivial to make sure that you're, to guarantee that you're definitely lost. <laughs> um, in our case, the geometric structure of the problem provides good termination conditions. So this is an example uh, pseudocode from the initialization routine. Uh, the robot will essentially try to bounce in the limit cycle. Um, it will try to bounce around twice um, and it will check to see if it's detecting the blue. So making sure that it's on the right, the correct side of the object. Um, but if you've tried to execute that limit cycle um, twice and you never saw blue, then you're definitely on the wrong side of the object and you're lost. So this is for, for robot two that can detect blue, but not yellow. So we can make do some nice reasoning that way. Um, and we found that it's worth considering these failure modes explicitly for minimalist robots in complex or dynamic environments. So they may be really robust in some situations, but you need to know the limits of, of their performance um, and being able to to actually guarantee that you know when you're lost so that you can stop moving or switch into a recovery mode. So here I'm, we're just going to demonstrate a proof of concept simulation. Um, due to the difficulty of simulating an infinite hallway, we have simulated a long rectangle twice. Um, here we're simulating a really weak design. So it's actually even weaker than robot three. Um, each of these agents uh, is just performing the limit cycle substrategy regardless of its initial location. So it's an open loop limit cycle substrategy demonstration. Um, and I had them going uh, counterclockwise in one and clockwise in the other. So we can see what happens. Um, so we see that even with this really open loop um, scenario where if they do get lost, they don't stop moving, they keep bouncing around over here. Um, we do see that a good amount of the robots um, do happen to be in that, do happen to either start in or find the region of attraction for the limit cycle so that they're bouncing around, as you can see here. Um, so we performed, you know, dozens of simulations. Um, this, these are unfortunately not in the paper, but um, I wanted to include them in this talk anyway. Um, so in all of our simulations, we saw that as long as the robots start on the, the left side of the object, even with this open loop scenario, they successfully push the object to the right consistently and um, much faster than if they were just moving randomly or bouncing randomly. Um, so this has really promising implications for future work on relaxing some of the assumptions we made in this paper, especially around range finding sensors and things like that. Um, just because even this open loop strategy is so robust. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, you could imagine, for example, a purely reactive design where the agents are just kind of moving randomly through space and then switch into this cycle mode when they're close enough to an object. Um, that would sidestep a lot of the issues with translating our results uh, onto a, a physical platform. So we'll go. Uh, so yeah, in conclusion, we're really excited about this work. Um, 
it shows the usefulness of boundary interactions and simple reactive strategies uh, for creating robust collective behaviors in constrained and complicated environments. Um, it's a promising new control mode for object manipulation or other tasks at small scales because it just relies on how the agent interacts with the boundary. Um, and it's a demonstration of how to how to do a formal design space exploration. So um, really taking the time to model what what primitives we have available as well as what our high level controller needs to look like um, and what kind of trade offs we give uh, by taking away sensors. Obviously, there's a lot of work that's needed to be done in the future for grounding this strategy design and sensor modeling in physical reality. So I'm very excited to work with um, people in the micro robot space on that. I'm also really excited on the theoretical side um, to move toward design automation in this space. So being able to uh, formalize these, these ideas between trade-offs of different sensors and um, make an actual design automation tool. So I really believe that scenarios like this one where the sensors uh, and sensor pre-images have a strong geometric tie to the workspace uh, are really well suited for automation. So uh, feel free to reach out to us, uh, any of the authors. Uh, we were all pretty equally involved in the work. So um, reach out to us by email or post a comment on this video if you're interested in any of these future directions uh, or if you have any other questions or comments about the work. Uh, Thank you for listening and thank you for the Wafer organizers for uh, keeping the spirit of this conference alive. And I'm looking forward to corresponding with people about this work. Thank you. <laughs>